When you think of the pinnacle of motorsport innovation, you probably think of Formula One. But what if I told you that groups of students from all around the world design and build cars that in some ways are more innovative than F1? These student-built cars might look like go-karts with wings, but they are fast and very advanced. Weighing only about 245 kilograms, they can pull up to 2.5 G in the corners and are powered by four electric motors. And one team even took their car to 60 miles per hour in less than a second. So I recently went to Oxford Brooks University to take a look at their Formula student car. I wanted to understand why they look the way they do and what kind of crazy technology makes them so fast. I'm going to break this down into three sections. The incredible powertrain, the unusual aerodynamics and the compact suspension. But before we get into the incredible engineering and tech, let's learn a little bit more about the Formula Student competition to understand what the teams are optimizing for and how it's all laid out, as it's really interesting. There are over a dozen major Formula Student competitions around the world, including the UK, US, Germany, Australia, Brazil, India and Japan. And the German show is often Often considered the largest and the most prestigious due to its highly competitive nature and the number of top tier teams that participate. When I visited Oxford Brooks the team was only a few weeks away from the UK competition at Silverstone, one of the oldest and most established events. And the UK competition is split into two sections, static events and dynamic events. The static events score the teams on how they've designed the car, how well they've used their budget and how fast their car is simulated to be. Teams need to present their work to a panel of judges, including friend of the channel, Willem Toet. In the theory of aerodynamics, it's deliciously complicated. So first we have the design event. Design event, which is um, where we explain everything about the car, the bits and bolts of how that part was designed, the way it was designed, why we developed the algorithms the way we did, and we justify all the decisions that we make uh, we made along the project. Next is the cost and sustainability presentation. Although there are essentially no budget limitations in Formula Student, teams are strictly judged on how efficiently they've used their money. So you have to justify the cost of your car. It doesn't um, make sense to have the fastest car if it's going to cost a lot of money. It has to make sense from a business perspective as well. Teams also make a business plan presentation reviewing the market landscape, their products and how they've marketed their car. Everything is set up like a real race team. Finally, there's a scrutineering and a lap time simulation where the teams perform a simulated lap with their car model to see how fast it can theoretically go. By the way, if you haven't seen our new wallet that has a real piece of F1 car embedded into it, check it out at 61.store. There are only 279 of these, so register your interest as sales will be opening soon. Then there are four dynamic events. This is where the cars are tested to see how well they brake, corner, accelerate and how efficient they are. First is an acceleration test, over 75 meters, where the fastest time wins. Then we have the skid pan event, which is basically a few laps around a figure of eight. The sprint event, which is like an auto test, is where the cars have to navigate around a small and quite twisty circuit. And the endurance event, which is where two drivers must complete 22 kilometers between them. And this event is weighted the highest in terms of points, making it the most important. Uh, the endurance event is where things get hot, to be honest, because we have 20 two kilometers where we have to perform and finish uh, so we have to push the car as fast as you can but you also have to make sure you finish the, the endurance so how do teams optimize for these different events and what cool tech are they using well let's take an overview of the oxford brooks racing car the car's total weight is just 244 kilograms less than a third of the weight of an f1 car and given the types of events and how twisty the circuits are weight is very important and the layout of the car is probably what you'd expect. The tub at the front where the driver sits, with the battery behind and the inverter on top of that. And you might be asking, where is the motor? Well, in fact, there are four motors, one for each wheel. And they're so small, they sit inside the wheels. So the Oxford Brooks racing car is four wheel drive and they can control each wheel independently, which means it can do some interesting things to make the car faster, but more on that later. In terms of aerodynamics, as you can see, these cars, relative to their size, have massive wings. The whole thing is basically a driver, a battery, and as much wing as you can fit in between. 
However, teams are restricted on wing size, much like in F1, with designs needing to fit within spaces of set dimensions. In terms of tyres, the choice is actually open, although most teams use Hoosiers as they're the right size for the car. Right then, let's get into the engineering. And for me, the most interesting part of the Oxford Brooks car is how they use the four motors. Now, as I mentioned, these things are tiny and weigh only about three kilograms each. They sit inside each of the wheels just like this, and they have a reduction gearbox on the back to lower the ratio. But what's most interesting is how the motors are programmed to help steer the car around the tight and twisty circuits through torque vectoring. It's like a tank. You have the right side and the left side, and you're able to accelerate the right side if you're making a left turn, accelerate the right side and decelerate the inside, and that allows you to turn very fast. And this individual control really helps the car to turn in and go through the corners, but there's more. Uh, we also have the traction control, which allows us to put the power down depending on which wheel has more traction. So that'd be like doing cornering, the outside wheels will have more traction if we can put more power there. So basically, as the car turns right, more load and therefore grip goes to the outside tires on the left and less grip on the inside tires. The system then understands the changes in loads and sends more or less power to each wheel, meaning it's using all of the available grip on each tire. And it's not just about turning. Doing acceleration, if one of the wheels has less traction because there's a wet spot, then we can move the power to the other three wheels. This means that the driver can hit the accelerator hard and the system will use the grip optimally, which means that it's significantly faster than a human would be without these systems. But how does it work? Well, imagine a driver is approaching a corner and turns into it. The system recognizes how much the driver has turned the steering wheel, basically where the driver wants the car to go. It then compares this value to the yaw, which measures how much the car is actually turning and whether it's understeering or oversteering. If the car isn't turning enough, if it's understeering, it will add more torque to the outside tires to get the car to turn more. And if the car's oversteering, the system will remove torque from the outside tires, straightening it up removing that oversteer. Of course, this is a very simple explanation of what is a complex system, but I just love understanding the fundamentals of how these things work. By the way, if you're interested in beginning or leveling up your career in motorsport, check out my new website, fluidjobs.com. We've created a list of the very best motorsport jobs and are building a resource to help people get into the sport that I love. So if that sounds good, head over to fluidjobs.com and set up some job alerts now. The motors are also used to regenerate energy for the battery and to slow the car down. And here, there's a big advantage. Again, because they have control of each individual wheel and the torque going to it, the team can build a system that acts like ABS. If a tyre starts to under-rotate or lock up, they can reduce the torque to that tyre and bring it back under control. But with traction control and ABS-like systems on all four wheels, there's a problem. For these systems to work, the car needs to know how fast it's going. Normally, there's something called a wheel speed sensor. It basically measures the wheel's RPM and multiplies it by the tire's circumference to get the speed. But if the wheel is wheel spinning, it's actually rotating faster than the car is moving. And in real world drive cars, this is okay. The system will take the average of the front two wheels, which as they're not driven, won't be wheel spinning. And they use this as the vehicle speed. The traction control system then compares the front and the rear wheel speeds. So if the front, the actual vehicle speed is 50 miles per hour and the rear wheel speed is 55 miles per hour, that's a 10% slip. The system will then know that there's wheel spin happening and can reduce power to the rear wheels. But if all four wheels are losing traction with over or under rotation, how does the car know how fast it's going? Well, that's where things get way more complicated. And as you might imagine, the wheels are slipping quite frequently. So the team have developed a speed estimation model where there's a series of rules and calculations to ensure they know exactly how fast the car is going. Now, I don't have time to explain it here as it is pretty complicated. Okay, so onto the aerodynamics and just take a moment to look at the crazy amount of wing on these cars. I just love how they look. We actually research Formula Student cars for project inversion because they create great downforce and weigh so little. Before ultimately we decided to go with something a little bit bigger and more F1 looking, the Empire Wraith. 
By the way, I do have an update coming soon. I know some of you have been asking in the comments. So just like F1, the teams can develop the wings and aerodynamic devices within specified areas of the car. A lot of the aero is mainly just to stay within uh, a set of boundary boxes. So we have that for the front of the car, the midsection of the car and the rear of the car and you basically have a lot of design freedom within those spaces. So let's take a look at each section. As you can see here, the front wing on the Oxford Brooks racing car is quite complex with multiple elements, just trying to capture all the downforce possible. Then we have the side wings. There are no side pods like you'd find on an F1 car because the Formula Student car doesn't need the same number of radiators. It runs off a battery. But the side wings do a similar job to the floor and diffuser on an F1 car. They create venturi tunnels that sucks the car and the tires into the track. Then at the back of the car, you have this massive wing. This year, it's been developed to have this swan neck, which mounts to the top surface of the wing rather than the bottom. The bottom of the wing produces more downforce, so it's beneficial to keep that part as smooth as possible. And because Formula Student dynamic events are quite twisty, the goal is to add as much downforce as possible without worrying too much about drag. So normally we're just trying to pack the downforce on just so that we can give the car as much mechanical grip as possible. And it's not just as simple as taking wings from an old F1 car or other race series and sticking them on a Formula Student car. All of the aero has been specifically designed and built for their car and for good reason. There's a lot of inspiration that comes from F1. Uh, in terms of the shapes of the front wings, the rear wings, but a lot of it is very different because of the wheelbase of the car and the relative closeness of all the, all the components, especially the suspension. It's not just taking things off of a Formula One car and making it smaller. And the team spend a lot of time designing and testing the aerodynamics. They'll work to understand the weaker areas of the car before then going to the drawing board. But before that, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is where you learn by doing. They have thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, programming, and AI. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that let you play with concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. And since I've used Brilliant myself, I've become both a better thinker and problem solver, always building knowledge on specific topics. I love how Brilliant's fun lessons can be accessed from anywhere, whenever you have time. And learning a little every day is one of the most important things you can do for both personal and professional growth. So if you'd like to try everything Brilliant offers for free for a full 30 days, then visit brilliant.org forward slash driver61 to start your free trial today or scan the QR code on screen. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. At the start of the year, there are about 80 students in the aero team who are then split up into four teams, all dedicated to different design possibilities for the car, who then run separate studies to see what kind of philosophy would be the best. And as the results come in, some of these designs are better than others. So four teams become two until finally they establish which direction they want to go with with the whole car. Then the whole team fully focuses on this concept for the rest of the season. And this team aren't using a wind tunnel like in F1. The team rely heavily on computational fluid dynamics or CFD, which is basically like a digital wind tunnel where the team tests how much downforce the car is producing. And the CFD allows designers to see if the car is working well as an entire piece because that's how aerodynamics needs to be looked at. The front wing affects the side wings, which affect the rear wing. So even in CFD, we never run isolated parts, really. We always run it in full car simulations, just so that we have uh, the full package in its cohesive state uh, working all together. So we, we know our aer aero package is solid. Once the car is designed and the team is happy with the CFD results, the parts then go into manufacture. They're all laid up in carbon on campus, apart from the tub, which is produced by Silverstone Composites. So that's the power and the aero done. Let's move on to suspension. Again, the rules are pretty open and the students have a lot of room to get creative. In fact, some of the top German teams even have active suspension, as we famously saw on the Williams FW14B. But active suspension isn't allowed under the UK Formula Student rules. So in terms of suspension, the Oxford Brooks car has a double wishbone push rod setup, which is similar to most F1 cars. 
And what was interesting when I had a look around the car was how thin and light the parts were. There's very little excess material there. The push rods move through a rocker, just like an F1 car, and then the load goes into a spring and damper. So for the team, it's then a case of setting up the suspension so the tire always has the maximum contact patch connected to the circuit. Our cars are relatively light compared to most cars you see on the road. We can get a lot of kind of bumping in the vehicles. Every bump means that you're actually losing contact patch um, and you reduce the amount of uh, force you're able to generate with those tires. The Oxford Brooks car even goes on a four poster rig to simulate the car driving. The, the rig will tell us information about uh, how the car is behaving and then we have certain tools we can use to tweak the setup or tweak the behavior and the handling that we can adjust when we are on track. Once this is done the team will head out and complete a few test days. Using Using something like a karting circuit as it's nice and twisty. But being a driver, one of the biggest questions I had was, with all that downforce, with the short wheelbase and the torque vectoring, how does it feel to drive? When they hop into the um, Formula shooting car, they're just like, it's like anything, it's like nothing I've driven before. With the torque vectoring, it's insane. With the traction control, it makes it easy to drive. So for them, it's just giving us feedback and then we can use that feedback to make the control system help them better. Of course, I did offer my services as a mature driver, but unfortunately, the team didn't think I was university material. I'm joking, of course, I went to university for a whole two months, but I wanna take a moment to thank the entire team at Oxford Brooks for giving me their time. And by the time this video goes out, they will have just competed in the UK competition. So hopefully they've got a nice new trophy. Now, one Formula student team got their car to accelerate to 60 in less than a second. And I made a video about that just up here. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.